Hello and welcome to the Elliptic Curveball. I'm your host, Bo Troxclair, and today we're going to be talking about the possibility of a hard fork in the Bitcoin blockchain, better known as BIP148, and its implications for you, the individual investor, as well as the Bitcoin community at large. So what is BIP148? Well, it's the UASF, or User Activated Soft Fork, that's being implemented by the Bitcoin Core Development Team that's meant to force adoption of BIP141, which is the scaling solution better known as SegWit. So what do I mean by scaling, and what the hell is a fork? Let's start with the scaling problem. Uh, as many of you may know, the Bitcoin community has been embroiled in a heated debate between the miners and the Bitcoin core developers as to how to best scale the network to meet transaction demand. You see, the Bitcoin network as currently implemented is capped at handling seven transactions per second. Uh, to put that number in a little bit of context, the Visa network handles on average 2,000 transactions per second, at peak usage 4,000 transactions per second, and has a theoretical limit of over 56,000 transactions per second. So in order for Bitcoin to fulfill the prophecy and destroy central banks and large financial institutions, it has to significantly increase its capacity in order to meet global transaction demand. Which brings us to forks. The Bitcoin protocol dictates that miners must add blocks to the longest valid chain, which is how BIPs implement software upgrades. They make it so that blocks that have not implemented the software upgraded are invalid soft forking the project into a functionally new chain. But if a BIP goes through without the majority support of the miners, then those miners who didn't accept the software upgrade will create a longer chain. But the miners that did accept the software upgrade will no longer consider that longer chain valid, and the blockchain will be split in twain, resulting in two competing parallel chains and a hard fork. That's why, as of BIP9, software upgrades require 95% consensus in order to go live. So what does that mean for the current scaling debate? Uh, there are basically two schools of thought. Uh, first, the miners, who, claiming to act in the spirit of Satoshi Nakamoto, are advocating a block size increase. The logic being that increasing the amount of data included in each block will subsequently increase the overall capacity of the network, which is true. The problem is, is that it may further centralize mining power to only those able to afford the top-of-the-line chips that can handle the ballooning size of the blockchain. Or, in other words, the rich will just get richer, or so the argument goes. Also, increasing the block size will require a hard fork. Uh, miners that accept 2 megabyte block sizes will no longer accept 1 megabyte block sizes and vice versa, uh, meaning that there could be a hard fork resulting in two parallel chains that are accepted by some miners but not all. The second major school of thought is the developers, who, also claiming to be working in the spirit of Satoshi Nakamoto, are proposing a software-side solution, i.e. SegWit, or BIP141, which more efficiently orders transactions to theoretically increase network capacity. The risk here revolves around how the core developers are implementing their network upgrade. BIP148 mandates acceptance of BIP141, or SegWit, at midnight on August 1st. Now, if the majority of mining power goes along with them, then for now, everything will be peachy keen. Uh, the Bitcoin network will have been upgraded, the scaling debate won't have been solved, but we won't have two Bitcoins. Uh, assuming, of course, that Bitmain doesn't make good on its threat to hard fork regardless. If, however, the majority of mining does not go along with them, then the non-BIP148 version will grow faster than the BIP148 version, resulting in the hard fork I described earlier and we'll have two separate Bitcoins, two different chains, and two different paths forward. There is a possible compromise forming around BIP91, uh, also known as the New York Agreement or SegWit2x, uh, but it's unanimously opposed by the Bitcoin core development team and only represents a handshake agreement and not a long-term solution. So we may as yet still see a hard fork despite the 85% signaling. This actually may not be the end of the world for Bitcoin investors. Uh, let's take the example of Ethereum. Uh, last May, the DAO, a crowdsourced venture capital fund built on top of the Ethereum blockchain, uh, billed itself as the crypto messiah leading the crypto sheep into the blockchain promised land. And they raised $150 million to do so. They also claimed that the fund didn't fall under the jurisdiction of any national or international law, but instead existed in the space between where code was law. 
Uh, the problem started when there was a bug in that code discovered that allowed hackers to drain $60 million from the DAO in under four hours. So eventually the Ethereum developers decided that the only solution was to hard fork the blockchain in order to refund the investors their ether. Uh, some people, however, took Slocket at their word and decided that this was a legal transaction in the code, which of course was law. So as a result of this division in the community, we now have Ethereum and the more philosophically pure Ethereum Classic. Uh, what's interesting to note is people that held Ethereum before the hard fork, who were also in control of their private keys, held both after the hard fork. Uh, the same thing may happen with Bitcoin on August 1st. What's key is if a hard fork does occur, you need to be in control of your private keys. Most people who've gotten involved in Bitcoin over the past year or so, especially in the United States, have bought them through an online exchange like Coinbase and continue to store them there, uh, which is understandable. Uh, Bitcoin right now is not the most user-friendly, and the cryptographic principles that underlie it are not the easiest to comprehend, thus this video. So trusting a reputable online exchange with your private keys is the easiest solution for the non-technical, or the technical yet lazy. Uh, but if you want to be able to cash in on both chains in the event of a hard fork, you need to be in control of your own account by August 1st. Why, you may ask? Well, there's no guarantee that in the event of a hard fork, any exchange will credit you both coins, or any at all. So how do you go about securing your private keys? Uh, there are basically three ways to accomplish this. First is to download a wallet app on your phone or computer, or use an online wallet like blockchain.info. This is the easiest solution, but anybody who knows anything about network security probably just shit their pants. You see, you can't be sure that your network or computer is not infected by some hacker waiting for you to do exactly that. And because Bitcoin transactions are irreversible once confirmed, you may just lose them forever. The second option is hardware wallets, which are a much safer solution. Uh, they're designed for security and ease of use, and costing anywhere from $30 to $200, uh, they're a reasonably cheap way to use your Bitcoins from day to day. Now, there are still problems with trusting your security to a third-party provider, but honestly, hackers are probably more likely to steal from someone who stopped this video right after I said blockchain.info. Uh, not only that, but at the end of the day, it does put you in control of your private keys, which is what's important. Third and finally are paper wallets, which is my preferred solution. Paper wallets are public-private key pairs that you generate on an offline computer, write down, and then hide like a pirate or a squirrel or a rich person. From a technical perspective, this is actually the only 100% secure way to generate a wallet. Um, I'll actually be putting out a video later this week detailing how to create paper wallets using only a jump drive and your home computer, uh, which is by no means the most secure way to generate paper wallets, but it does provide a reasonable degree of security at minimal cost, uh, and it doesn't require you to buy any special hardware. It's actually a fairly simple process, and once you've done it once, you'll be able to do it in more secure environments, uh, which can satisfy even the most paranoid desires of your heart. If you'd like more information on any of the topics covered in this video, feel free to look in the description for some educational resources and links. Um, also, a special shout out to Epicenter Bitcoin, which, if you're not familiar, is an incredible podcast that you should absolutely be listening to if you're involved in cryptocurrency. Uh, specifically, I'd like to give a shout out to Jimmy Song, who's doing a lot of great work writing on Medium, and whose content this video owes a lot to. Remember to like and subscribe if you found this video helpful. And stay tuned later this week for more cryptocurrency news, analysis, and tutorials. I'm Botroxclair, and this has been the Elliptic Curveball. Thank you all for watching.